Welcome to St. Matthew. Thank you for joining our digital community. We would love to connect with you, so feel free to shoot us an email at info at stmatthew.org, and we can set up a time to meet you in person or through Zoom. Now you're joining us in the season of Lent. Lent is the 40 plus days leading up to Easter. This Lent, we're spending the entire season focusing our church and our personal energy toward hope. So as a Lenten practice this year, don't give up anything. We've spent an entire year giving stuff up. All of us have been doing the equivalent of one big, continuous, involuntary Lent since March of last year. We've given up tons. So instead, figure out some kind of practice or commitment that will help you to care for friends, families, neighbors, and yourself this Lenten season. Our deepest prayer as you join us today is that you feel God's love, peace, and pervasive hope as we worship together. God of all creation, unbound by space and time, we confess our weariness as we log on once more in search of a holy connection. Though we would not choose to meet this way, we hold to the promise that you choose always to meet us where we are. When we feel the inadequacy of digital presence, Remind us that you, O oh Lord, are fully present, even here. When we feel the strain of needing to perform who we are, when we are seen but not known, remind us that you, O oh Lord, know us completely. When we are tempted to trust the illusion of the screen and flatten others in dismissal, Remind us that behind each square sits a living, breathing child of God. Behind each comment, a person in need of your love. When we fail to engage others well, show us your grace. When others fail to engage us well, may we show your grace. When it feels as though even our prayers are spoken into a void, speak to us your words of life, which never return empty. When we come to the edge of our limits, surprise us again with the fullness of your life, a life that lives in and flows through each of us, unhindered by blurry pixels and distorted sound. Lord Jesus Christ, image of the invisible God, give us faith to see your substance in the virtual. O Christ, in whom all things hold together, hold us together even in this time of physical separation. By your Spirit, make us one, as your Spirit has always done that in the endless bluish glow that illumines our days and nights, we might be able still to see your endless light. Hello friends. Today I want to talk to you about words. I love reading and writing and words in general, so when I learn something new about words, it makes me happy. So here's a fun fact. Did you know that there are words we use today that mean something totally different now than they did years ago? It's true. A very long time ago, a clue was a ball of yarn. Today, of course, a clue means bits of evidence that can help us solve things. And how about the word nice? If someone says you're nice, that's a compliment, right? But it used to mean silly, foolish, or simple. Oh, 
that's not the same at all, is it? Here's another one. Awful. Awful things used to be worthy of awe, respect, or admiration. Something amazing. But I bet if you told your mom or dad that the dinner they worked so hard to cook for you was awful, they would not think that was a compliment. Now during Lent, we're going to be talking about another word that I love, hope. What does hope mean? Hope is to expect that something you want to happen will happen. It means trust, expectation for something good. But I think when we use the word hope, we sometimes give it a different meaning than it's supposed to have. We get it backwards. Here's what I mean. When we say on a cloudy day, I want to go out to play after lunch, I hope it doesn't rain, we're really saying, I don't want it to rain, but it probably will. That use of the word hope is actually backwards. When we use hope in this way, we're saying that we want something good to happen, but we're really expecting something bad. And that's not what God wants for us at all. Do you ever find yourself using the word hope backwards? I know I do. Sometimes I feel like we've been living with coronavirus restrictions forever, and I hope things will change soon and the world will feel safe and normal again, but really, I have actually lost the expectation and trust that something good will happen. It looks kind of like this. I have here two balloons. They look the same, right? They're shaped the same, they're the same color, they're identical on the outside, but they are very different on the inside. See, when I have that feeling that things are probably not going to get better, I have no hope. I just want to fall straight to the ground and I feel like I can't stand up under the weight of a difficult situation. But if I could just change my way of thinking and believe when I say I hope things will get better, that God can use all things for good, then I have real hope. Do you see the difference? When we have hope, we are just like the balloon that floated up, up, and away. We can rise above whatever is challenging us. And that's the kind of hope that God wants us all to have. Hope that allows us to arise above our problems. Now, do you know how to get that kind of hope? I'll give you a hint. Think about where you looked when I let that balloon go. You watched it float up, right? God is the God of fulfilled promises. When we put our hope in the Lord, we are believing that what he says is true and we're believing that he will do what he says he's going to do. I know you were looking up at a balloon, but it's a good reminder that we can get our hope from looking up to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to keep the real meaning of hope in mind, especially when we're struggling. May we always keep our eyes and hearts turned toward you and do our best to lift others up. Amen. Oh Lord my God When I in awesome wonder Consider all The world's your hands have made I see I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to 
take away my sin Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art, how great Thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to. How great thou art, how great thou art. When I was a little kid, I had one of those digital clock radios. I love that thing. It stirred this deep curiosity within me. I remember pushing all the buttons and turning the dials, trying to figure out how it worked. Now the first chance I got when my parents were busy, I found my dad's screwdriver and I opened it up. I knew that if I could open the case, I could figure this thing out. So one by one, I popped the screws. Then I had the casing off and I found more screws. So I took out those screws, and as I did, each piece of that clock radio was laid out on the floor. You had the little speaker, the wires, the digital screen, the battery pack, and those like super green circuit boards. This was the first time I'd ever seen one of those, and it looked like its own city or galaxy with all these different connectors. So being five-ish, I didn't stop there. I had to pop off all of those cool soldered little buildings connecting the circuit board. So you can imagine how my parents felt when they came back into the room. Now with a completely deconstructed and broken clock radio. But for me, it was the beginning of wonder. It's also probably the beginning of my parents' knowledge that if I get quiet, something's being destroyed. The gift of wonder has been a key navigator of my life. I wanna understand how things work and why they're created. I love deconstruction for the purpose of understanding. And growing up, hope and wonder, they were the perfect dance partners. With every new wonder came a deeper dive into hope, and with each drop of hope came more wonder, and for decades I danced with these two partners guiding me. But in my late 20s, after some rocky experiences and more lived life and more deconstruction that only uncovered brokenness and often uncovered that the idea or thought or organization was actually more of an illusion than a reality, my wonder started turning into cynicism. And this new dance partner didn't dance well with hope. So hope faded, as did my wonder. And the cynicism began to rule my day. Now, cynicism and wonder are philosophical cousins. They're both questioners. They both call us to move outside of conformity towards a deeper freedom. 
But living the way of cynicism did not create in me the freedom I was looking for. You want a biblical picture of cynicism? Turn to Ecclesiastes or just follow along on the screen as I read from Ecclesiastes chapter one. The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless. Meaningless, said the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea, it's never full. To the place the streams come from, there they actually return again. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too. It's just chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. This is depressing, right? Solomon, as he wrote this, had grown a bit cynical. I think there is a better way. When we talk about cynicism today, we don't usually mean cynicism in the classical philosophical sense. What cynicism has become, it's often thought of as cool, right? Standing aside and apart from the common herd. It suggests to the cynical that somehow it's more intellectual or more morally superior. It's a sign of being special. Uh, looking down on others from the heights of better knowledge and understanding. Now, forgive me for saying so, but having lived as a cynic, I think this is hogwash. Cynicism is actually both depressingly common and commonly depressing. Why? Because among other things, it destroys wonder. The irony of cynicism is that it does not only shield one from intense suffering, but also from such things as joy and reverence and awe and love. See, cynicism for me was at best a weak defense. And in some ways, it wasn't even a defense at all. The cynic diminishes things to a point where they cease to have emotional implications. And then they can joke about or altogether ignore these feelings, no matter how elevated or terrible they might be. It's a means of attenuating the very sensation of being alive to the point of where life for me became benign. And my living experience was diminished. It was impoverished. But if we can allow a little wonder in Everything is transformed. See, we see this in Luke 18 when Jesus is doing what Jesus did amongst his people and he starts laying hands on children. Scripture says people were bringing children and infants to him so that he might touch them. When the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered the families not to do it. But Jesus called to them and said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. What question embodies childhood? Why? The why question is 
a question of wonder and hope. If you have a toddler like me, you may despise why because it's in your house four billion times a day. But the why of children actually awakens us to curiosity and discover and wonder and hope. All beautiful dance partners. And part of what makes receivers, what makes us receivers of the kingdom of God is this ability to have the childlike curiosity. Take prayer for an example. Without wonder, prayer is no more than a list of requests. Sometimes, let's be honest, demands or a series of apologies for sins, either real or imagined, that focus tends to remain firmly on ourselves. And then we fall easily into cynicism because, not surprisingly, God doesn't see the world as we see it. So our idea of how our prayer should be answered are often disappointed. But with wonder added in our prayers, we realize that we're not addressing a God who's out there or up there, but we're addressing a God who is in here, who's near us, who loves us, who wishes to be known by us, and whose ideas are infinitely more amazing than our own. See, what I've discovered on this side of cynicism is that wonder actually begets more wonder. And discovery does not cease the wonder, but actually propels it forward like a rocket into outer space. If, if you ever watch a movie or a documentary about an astronaut who's been in outer space, the wonder in them as they float through space only triggers for them a deep desire to go further, to go deeper into space. And this wonder in them triggers hope. So as we were planning as a staff this Lenten season, I became keenly aware that cynicism during this pandemic had started creeping back into my life. And it was eating, no, it was devouring my hope and wonder. I don't know about you, but I want hope. Hope isn't something we can drum up within ourselves. Hope is a gift given to us when Jesus draws near to us in a time of our honesty and fear. Now, I want hope to be the turn of my life, not cynicism. So as a staff, we decided that instead of taking a traditional Lenten path, we were going to do a deep dive, an all-in dive to hope. Believing that hope accompanied by God meeting us in this very moment of our pandemic will reawaken a childlike curiosity, restore our wonder, and help us reconstruct a way forward post this pandemic. With all that in mind, here's going to be our working definition of hope. Hope is a faithful confidence that God continues to author a story that moves us from vision to action. The journey of hope, real hope, deep hope, hope that stretches well beyond optimism and wishful thinking, often leads us through terrain that we would rather avoid. See, hope is a gift. It's not the result of some effort, but there are some essential actions that we can take to prepare ourselves. Because hope comes with God, then we need to be positioning ourselves for the presence of God. Positioning ourselves begins with honesty with ourselves and honesty to God about our dissatisfaction. Now, we tend to look down on people who express dissatisfaction, particularly in the church. At best, we treat them as whiners. At worst, we consider their expression of dissatisfaction in their life to be sinful. So in verbal and nonverbal ways, we communicate to the dissatisfied that your negative point of view clearly indicates you're not connected to God. If you were a better Christian, you wouldn't be so dissatisfied. We tell the dissatisfied that they don't have enough faith. We treat them like a squeaky will and we shun them as immature. And in doing so, we're revealing our ignorance of Scripture. Because in the Bible, we find example after example after example where dissatisfied people and faith coexist. Where frustration with the way things are and a deep sense of hope actually are beautiful friends. 
Because being dissatisfied with the way things are leads us to wonder if there might be a better way. And seeing the better way leads us to have a vision. And vision takes us from despair into the action of hope. This life journey toward hope is what this series is all about. Real hope. Faithful confidence that God continues to author a story that moves us from vision to action. Please pray with me. God, we long to be a people of wonder, of discovery, and of hope. This Lenten season, give us an awakening to where you are in the midst of our dissatisfaction and give us a vision for how all of that can be different. We pray this in your name, amen. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord God, my Father. Fear is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not in thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been. Now forever will be great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see all I Friends, this is the joyful feast of unity. Christ has gathered his people around the earth to commune at his table. Across political lines and economic lines, in places of powerful affluence and among the poorest of the poor, we share a meal remembering and celebrating the one who proved shalom possible. And so come from wherever you are and in whatever state you find yourself. Come, come with your doubts, come with your hopes, come with your inadequacies, and come with your strengths. Come, for this is a table where all are invited and all are welcome. Scripture tells us on the night in which Christ's love was made most manifest, he was sharing a meal with his friends and he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat and remember me. 
In the same way, he took the cup and blessed it and said, this is the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and remember me. And Paul reminds us that every time we eat of these common elements, we do so remembering the love of Christ. Please pray with me the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you share the bread, offer the bread of life and the cup of grace. Hi, I'm Mandy, Director of Communications and Marketing. Stay tuned each week to hear the most up-to-date information about what's happening at St. Matthew. Ladies, today is the last day to register for our IF gathering. This virtual women's conference will be held on Friday, March 5th through Saturday, March 6th. The cost is $39 for full access, which includes all breakout sessions, Plus, you can rewatch any of the sessions on demand until the end of the year. Be sure to join us today anytime between 10 and noon for a drive through farewell parade for the Taylor family as they head off to plant a church in Arizona. No sign up needed, just show up. Healing Prayers meets this Tuesday from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. All are welcome to join for personal and individual prayer. Join Pastor Rustin, Council President Karen Ball, and the Vision and Values Growth Task Force for the first St. Matthew Fireside Chat next Sunday, February 28th at 5 p.m. on Zoom. They'll be discussing our motto and values, plans for in-person worship, and the strategic direction for the next 180 days as we prepare to fully relaunch all of our ministries in the fall. Registration for Hume Lake Summer Camp is open now on a first-come, first-served basis. This trip is open to students in 8th through 12th grade. Coffee with the Pastor is back. Sign up and place your order for your favorite coffee or tea drink. Your drink and your pastor will be waiting for you. Because of your generosity, we've been able to deliver at least 20 bags of groceries to the Monument Crisis Center each week. We'll continue to collect food donations Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. To learn more about all of these and other events at St. Matthew, visit our website and click the Happening Now tab. This page is updated weekly, so be sure to check back. If you have preschool through elementary age children, our Spark curriculum is now available online. There are weekly videos, parent guides, and activities you can print out to do at home. If you'd like more information on kids ministry, please contact Sue Burke at suebb at stmatthew.org. If you use social media, we would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. St. Matthew is a neighborhood church making a world of difference. And the only way we can do that is through your generosity. We have three simple ways to give. First, by visiting our website, stmatthew.org give and following the easy steps. 
Second, you can set up recurring bill pay through your financial provider. And third, you can give with your cell phone right now by texting GIVE to 925-854-4402. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope you feel the love of God and your neighbor. Go in peace and serve the Lord. One of the patterns we have started developing at St. Matthew is that of community rhythms. Many of us grew up in spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible reading and quiet time, and these rhythms were central in helping us grow and mature in our faith. A rhythm for us is simply a pattern. It's a pattern that we commit to to help us fall more in love with God, our neighbor, and ourself. I believe that curiosity and wonder are the beginning of hope because they open us up to God. Curious people are almost never cynical. Some of my favorite people are relentlessly curious. How do we become more curious? Here are some ideas to get us started. Today's rhythm is one of building curiosity and one of action. So schedule some thinking time. Busyness is the enemy to wonder. So make some time to just think about new things, new ideas, new concepts. Ask more questions. Great leaders ask questions even more than they give answers. And people who ask questions, they're just more fun to be around, aren't they? Give fewer answers. I have to check my own tendency inside to want to give certainty on everything. Giving fewer answers in an everyday conversation can help. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Saying I don't know can lead us to better answers than we would have come up with on the spot. Say yes. Say yes more times this week than you say no. If you're a parent, think about spending a whole day saying yes to your kids. Wonder. Kids wonder. Adults, we stop wondering. So reverse that trend. Stop taking things for granted. Gratitude can make us more open to everything. Ask why. Challenge assumptions. Ask why not. Why not, after all? Try to find connections between random things. Read outside of your area. You can do this in a big way by buying a book on astronomy or something that you're curious about, or you can do it casually. Finally, get around some kids. Kids still believe, and they might inspire you to do the same. So dance, celebrate, sing, Shout for joy because Christ goes before us into this world of fear and pain. He's called us to bring the good news of healing hope and of redemption. So go in peace and feel the presence of Christ with you now and forever. Amen.